Fox Sports 1340 AM presents to you. WMER, Wrestling Marks of Excellence Radio. Starring The Firm, J-Lo, Nephew, Corey, and Dr. D. Bringing you the latest up-to-date information on professional wrestling and sports entertainment. Now, live from the Fox Sports 1340 studios in Hopewell, Virginia. Hey, welcome wrestling fans. Welcome wrestling fans. Welcome to another edition of the Wrestling Marks of Excellence here on Fox Sports Radio 1340. I'm your host, g I'll also be joined by Black Dollar himself, Pipe Bomb, Champ Creek, Gangster. Also, my man, the Infinite One, Nephew Corey, the Wizard, we join us. And you never know when Dr. D, we join us as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a wonderful show for you tonight. We have on, we have as our special guest, who will be coming on a little bit later, Ivan Koloff, that's right, the man who broke Bruno San Martino's streak, the man, the former WWF champion, uh, one of the most hated wrestlers of all times in the 60s, 70s, and late 80s. Maybe join us a little bit later uh, to share his thoughts and his views in the wrestling world and we'll catch up with him and find out what he's doing now uh, since he's been retired since 1994. But that's one, and that's a little bit later on the road. Ivan, the Russian bear, uh, will be joining us here on the Wrestling Marshal Excellence a little bit later. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you missed this past Monday Night Raw, you missed the ad. Okay, Raw, uh, needs to get better in order to compete with football, which you know he knows nothing can compete with Monday Night Football. Uh, as football and starts this Thursday, coming up this Thursday, or starts tonight, uh, as ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this on Thursday. Um, Dolph Ziggler, we kicked the show off with a highlight reel, uh, with a highlight reel with Chris Jericho, which included John Cena, Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, Kane, uh, excuse me, Seth Rollins. Um, Kane, Triple H, and Randy Orton uh, were coming out of Triple H telling John Cena was best for business. And what eventually this turned into, it turned into a six-man match to be the main event of the night. Uh, we saw, uh, but the match, the match that opened up the show uh, was Dolph Ziggler and Sheamus taking on Cesaro and The Miz. Uh, Miz had his, uh, as you want to call it, his stunt double uh, out there, uh, Miz Dow. Uh, with setting there, Damian Sandow, plus a new makeup artist. Um, I love this gimmick by the Miz. You're talking about a gimmick that catches a lot of heat from the wrestling fans. This gimmick right here definitely catches heat from the wrestling fans. And Dol- um, the Miz is living up to, hey, what it is, it's very simple to hate the guy. The guy likes to be hated. Uh, but very deep in match was going back and forth here. Uh, we finally got Dolph Ziggler in the ring after the crowd. Been boom- I've been cheering for him a long time. Uh, then uh, Sheamus actually gives him the hot tag. And then we get Dolph Ziggler in the ring. Uh, and needless to say, after interference and reactions, Miz gets to win uh, with giving Dolph Ziggler the final, uh, squ- uh, uh, excuse me, squ- uh, question finale. We also had, uh, we also saw on this past episode of Monday Night Raw, the Big Show and Mark Henry taking on the Wyatt family. Uh, we saw Mark Henry and the Big Show be a great tag team. And saw them get the win by the Q. As I mentioned last week, I think this is a great tag team uh, in the making. Two older guys, two older gentlemen, per se, um, towards the end of their career. Why not give them the tag team titles? They're both of major superstars. Let it get get a little rub, get a little run. And then who eventually, whoever they lose to, you can give them a push and let them put those guys over uh, and let them move those guys move to another level. Let let Big Show and Mark Henry get the title. That's my that's my opinion on that one. We saw Jack Swagger uh, facing somebody other than Rusev. Swagger had a match with uh, Curtis Axel. Good to see Curtis Axel getting some singles time, even though Ryback is gone. Uh, if you don't have not heard, Ryback had a little bit of surgery uh, last week. Nothing, not a rumor, not a dirt sheet. It's something he tweeted himself. He'd be gone from WWE for a couple of weeks. Uh, good to see. Uh, his surgery was a success, but it's good to see Curtis Axel back in singles, singles competition. I think this young man has a lot of talent, has a tremendous upside, and needs to create a name for himself. The Paul Heyman thing didn't work. Ryback, Ryback Axel did not work. Um, it's good for it's time for Curtis Axel to set himself apart from everybody else uh, and to become a big major player and a big time player uh, in the WWE. He has great talent, he has great skills, has great in ring ability. Uh, he just needs something to get him over uh, to the next level. Uh, but we saw Jack Swagger get the win over Curtis Axel on this past Monday Night Raw. Saw Titus O'Neil. Titus O'Neil have not. I haven't seen Mr. O'Neil in a minute. Uh, it's good to see uh, Titus uh, in his barking shovel. Uh, but he took on Adam Rose. Uh, Adam Rose came out with his little, with his bunny and entourage as well. But Titus O'Neil loses to Adam Rose. 
uh, in a OK type match. Uh, we saw Rusev uh, taking on someone uh, one other than Jack Swagger, as I mentioned earlier. But he took on everybody's friend, everybody's buddy, everybody's homeboy, everybody, everybody man. That's right, Jack Zach Ryder. Uh, Zach Ryder was on with Rusev, and uh, needless to say, ladies and gentlemen, that was a quick match, a very decent quick match. Uh, Rusev defeats Jack Swagger uh, very quickly and handily there. Then we saw Gold Dust. Gold Dust taking on uh, Jimmy Uso. This is uh, once again a leading up to the Night of Champions pay view where Gold Dust is. And his tag team partner, Stardust, takes on the Usos for the WWE Tag Team title, which I think will seal the show uh, of that night. I think we one of the best matches of the night on that card. I think even though Goldust is pushing 50 and Cody is no by far uh, not an old man, neither are the Usos, that they will carry this pay-per-view and carry this match. And this match would definitely be one of those matches that people will be talking about for a long time. Uh, with the Usos, in my opinion, getting the win there, uh, then we saw, as I said earlier, the main event of the night, Roman Reigns, Kane, and Seth Rollins take it on. Uh, Chris Jericho, Roman uh, Roman Reigns, and Dean Ambrose. Uh, we very decent match there. You've seen, seen six men, six futures uh, of the WWE, six people in the WWE who will be there for a while. I dare to say somebody look at me funny and might laugh at me. I dare to say that everyone in that ring will be a Hall of Famer. One day, somebody might be saying, well, Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins haven't proved anything yet. Those two guys, just by being the Shield alone, uh, will uh, be in, in the Hall of Fame. Um, the Shield was a tremendous entity uh, that impacted WWE for over a year and a half, almost two years. And I believe to say that, in my opinion, that these guys will be Hall of Famers. All six guys in the ring one day will be Hall of Famers. Four definitely are Hall of Famers, Kane, Randy Orton, Chris Jericho and John Cena very definitely a first ballot Hall of Famers uh, if you want to stay in that in that realm in that realm of that vein uh, would definitely be there. Um, very decent Raw. Some people didn't like it. I think anytime wrestling is on Monday night is okay. It wasn't garbage. Uh, it wasn't the best. Uh, but it, it was one of those Raws was setting up Night of Champions uh, for the future. I think a lot of the biggest complaints for Monday Night Raw was the very um, multiple segments. Yes, I know some of y'all was waiting for it. When is he going to get on the Bella Twins? Well, if I wasn't married, I'd be on them all the time. But anyway, uh, <laughs> we have a uh, Bella Twins were very much so heavily packaged on Monday Night Raw, the issue between the Bella Twins. Uh, once again, very poor acting by Nikki Bella. Um, at least if you're going to give her to me, shove her down my throat or give her a lot of vignettes, at least make sure the acting uh, is believable. Please make sure that acting is believable. Believable. Make sure it's something that, that I can buy into. If anything, you're not selling any pay-per-views with the Night of Champions. Um, they're not even champions, so this match shouldn't even be on the card of the Night of Champions pay-per-view. I hope it's not. Let's stick to the WWE. Let's stick to, if you're listening out there, WWE World. Let's stick to, to the pay-per-view uh, format and what the pay-per-view is called. Only title matches should be on the card. It, it's Night of Champions. Let the titles uh, reign supreme, at least for one chance, at the IC title, the U.S. title, tag team title, Divas title, and the World Heavyweight Championship title be the only matches on the card. Don't oversaturate the pay-per-view with the Bella Twins feud. Uh, let it carry on to whatever the next pay-per-view is uh, in, in the next uh, upcoming month. Uh, but do not, please do not put this on the pay-per-view card once again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, also coming up this Sunday night, if you're not heard, if you missed it, if you've been underneath the box, Total Divas returns for the third season. That's right. Clap it up, clap it up, clap it up, clap it up. Total Diva returns. Total Divas return on this Sunday night. I will have my popcorn ready to watch. Somebody say, you ain't watching football? Bump it. My Redskins play at 1 o'clock p.m. We're watching Total Divas, ladies and gentlemen. In my house, we watch Total Divas. Hey, DVR the game, whatever. Unless my fantasy team is rolling, uh, I'm watching Total Divas. Uh, only time I don't watch Total Divas on is when uh, you have a pay-per-view on, and I'm watching the next morning. But Sunday night, I will be there sitting there watching Total Divas. Well, it's going to be live. I'll be watching it when it comes on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the Wrestling Monster X and on Fox Sports Radio 1340. Yo, if you want to hit me up, you got like, any uh, comments about what I said, do you like it, you don't like it, yo, hit us up at 347-838-8776, or hit us up on Twitter at Burn Wrestling, or hit us up on Facebook at Dr. D. Again, ladies and gentlemen, hey, Total Divas show Monday Night Raw is decent. Um, Monday Night Raw is definitely 
taking off and getting ready to go play some new Monday Night Wars. Uh, if you missed that new episode, which came out this past Tuesday night, uh, you missed a very good episode. Man, WWE is definitely doing some things with this Monday Night War. I believe there's 20 episodes to this documentary. Um, it's wonderful. Step back and watch it. You laugh and enjoy some things that you've never seen, things that you never heard, some things that if you've seen, uh, you can relive it again. I don't work for the WWE Network. I wish I did. I wish I worked for the WWE, but I don't. Uh, 999 can't beat it. You only can get it on the network, ladies and gentlemen. You only can get it on the network. It's great Monday Night Wars. Uh, check it out if you missed it from this past Tuesday night. Check it out. You also if you missed the main event from this past Tuesday night. You saw a little buttocks uh, in the Divas match. I uh, checked that out as well for all you guys who like to post that stuff, look at that stuff. Check it out on check it out on the network. Uh, that's right, the network. The WWE Network, you can catch all that stuff on the network. Uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Wrestling Monster X1C on Fox Sports Radio 1340. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, we'll be back with none other than one of the most hated wrestlers of all time. That's right. The black, the the Russian, the Russian bear, the Russian bear, Ivan Koloff, will be joining us. Uh, once again, hit us up on Twitter at Firm Wrestling. Hit us up on Facebook at Dr. Dina Firm. And we'll be right back after this commercial break. K&L Barbecue at 1410 Maple Street inside Cavalier Square, Hopewell. Wants you to know they have great specials on the daily menu, such as hamburger steaks, grilled chicken, a lightly fried chicken sandwich, and of course, the best chicken and dumplings in the Tri-Cities. And don't forget about their world-famous barbecue and sauce. Dine in or carry out at K&L Barbecue. Call 458-4241. That's 458-4241 for K&L Barbecue. Hello, my name is Andy Clark, and I'm an agent with Ligon Jones Insurance Services in downtown Hopewell. I'm here to tell you that at Ligon Jones Insurance, we're dedicated to serving you. You've heard all the gimmicks and sales pitches from 800 number and online companies, and we can offer all the same options, such as accident forgiveness, disappearing deductibles, 24-hour claim service, home and auto discounts, and much, much more. What we offer that they can't is local knowledge and experience, a broader selection of companies and coverages, and personal service. When you call, email, or stop by Ligon Jones Insurance, you will speak to Lucky, Sherry, or myself, and you will not have to press one for English or wait for the next available representative. We don't just sell insurance. We back it up with great customer service. At Ligon Jones Insurance Services, we have over 60 years' experience. We all live in the Tri-Cities area, and we support many different local charities. From hot dog carts to hotels, we can cover it all. So if you want better pricing, better coverage, and better service, all from a company that gives back to the community. Call Ligon Jones Insurance at 458-8522 or go to www.ligonjones.com. Hemco, a family-owned business which operates as a full-service buyer, processor, and seller. Hemco purchases, collects, processes, then remits any and all salvageable materials such as copper, brass, aluminum, stainless steel, and much more for the recycling industry. That's Hemco, Hopewell Iron and Metal Company, located at 213 South 6th Avenue, Hopewell, Virginia. For services or questions, call Hemco at 458-8514, open Monday through Fridays, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's Hemco, Hopewell Iron and Metal Company. This is referee Brian Hebner from TNA Impact Wrestling, and you're listening to Wrestling Marks of Excellence on Fox Sports Radio 1340. Fox Sports 1340 AM presents to you WMER, Wrestling Marks of Excellence Radio, starring The Firm, J-Lo, Nephew, Corey, and Dr. D, bringing you the latest up-to-date information on professional wrestling and sports entertainment. Now, live from the Fox Sports 1340 studios in Hopewell, Virginia. Hey, welcome back, wrestling fans. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Wrestling Marks of Excellence here on Fox Sports Radio 1340. As I promised you, ladies and gentlemen, we are here. He is here. We were with the man who broke Bruno San Martino's uh, championship reign, the second WWE, WWF champion at the time, one of the most hated wrestlers in all of WWE, all of NWA, all of Mid-South Wrestling, everywhere he went. He was one of the top heels in the company. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the, uh, the Russian bear, Ivan Koloff. How are you doing today, Mr. Koloff? Yes, you are, Mr. Koloff. Yes, I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you, Andy. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, sir, man. I can't complain. It's great to have you back here on the Wrestling Monster for Excellence. Uh, we had you here a couple of years ago, and uh, by request, we, we definitely get glad that we can be able to have you again here on the Wrestling Monster for Excellence. We appreciate you for joining us. Um, once again, sir, 
It has been a privilege and an honor. We know that you're retired now, but you've been wrestling uh, for many years, started back in 1961, I believe. Uh, what, what, you know, what made you love the sport of pro wrestling growing up? Uh, and I'm about to case fable, go over, over for some of you guys. Growing up in the town of Canada, uh, where you say, no, you're not, not wrestling, really Russian. Uh, what, what made you fall in love with the sport of professional wrestling? First of all, I've been Russian all my life. Russian <laughs> here, Russian there. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I appreciate you asking that because uh, I was only about eight years old. I was raised very humbly in the family up in uh, yeah, Canada. What happened there was uh, I was such a bad boy in Russia that they, uh, they kicked me out of the country, put me on a raft down the Bering Strait, that some Canadians pulled me in down on the West Coast and uh, raised me. Uh, <laughs> that's a little far-fetched, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, at the farm, uh, I mean, we didn't have uh, electricity, running water, and like that. Uh, we ended up uh, communicating with smoke signals. <laughs> Not smoke signals, <laughs> but it just seemed like that. Uh, and, you know, I'm just talking about back, uh, you know, 60, 65 years. It was, uh, it just seems like another lifetime, but uh, we didn't have all these entries that we have today, like all the different uh, telephones and uh, TVs and all this. And my mom and dad had a friend that had what they call a television set. And uh, just about 1950, I was about eight years old. And I remember we went over there and uh, wrestling was on. Oh, man, I fell in love with it. They had uh, some old-time wrestlers on there, uh, guys like uh, Gorgeous George and Ricky Starr. I mean, a whole bunch of guys that, uh, man, I really uh, fell in love with, you know. And I just said, uh, that's what I want to be. I want to be a wrestler one day. And, of course, I was a middle child, so I went uh, out there to my brothers that always uh, test me, oh, you're going to be a champion. You're going to be a wrestler. Uh, let's see how tough you are. And, uh, you know, they try to beat me. We get into real, you know, slug out fights sometimes. <laughs> Come back with a black eye or a bloody nose or Mother got our case. What are you guys doing? Beat down. She called me little, her little champ. I guess that didn't help at all. <laughs> then they turned around and called me Mama's boy. You know. <laughs> mm-hmm. So to this day, my older brother calls me Mama boy. I said, "Oh, thank you." <laughs> I'm proud of being Mama's boy because she encouraged me as a kid to, uh, you know, continue my dream and become a wrestler. And, uh, and that's what happened. That's why I first uh, fell in love with it. And I'd, I'd go see it uh, whenever I could, but I didn't get to see it much at all. A couple live shows that really uh, impressed me. I remember going to some shows around the Toronto area, and there'd be guys like, later on, like Bulldog Brower, uh, Yukon Eric, uh, and uh, some great guys, Whipper Billy Watson, uh, man. Uh, and I just fell in love with this uh, business. And I, that's what I wanted to do. At 19 years old, of course, I pursued it and ended up uh, going to wrestling school and learning the ropes. And, man, I was excited about it. Uh, that's why I applied myself so much, you know. Yeah. Wrestling, you said going to wrestling. How much did wrestling school cost you back then? Uh, what did it What did it cost you to go to wrestling school? What the guy told me, Jack Wentworth, he was a British Empire champion, he said, which was quite a bit of money then, he said, uh, look, you're only 183 pounds. You need to put on some weight. Tell you what I'll do. And uh, start to wrestle. Uh, if you get ready before six months, I'll start you off at that. And later on, I'll, I'll give you a rate that you can uh, be paid. In. in six months, I was ready to wrestle because I went from 183 to about 235, lifting weights and force feet myself. And he was impressed anyway. And I guess what really convinced him about uh, about that time was that they have wrestling matches on Thursday night. The public could pay like a dollar to get in. And uh, he only had charged me $500 for a six-month trial that to see if I could gain the weight back. Well, I made it for sure, and uh, I ended up uh, being so excited about it, going down to one of the... The first time I went down to one of these shows, it was uh, Al Bell and uh, another guy named Sailor Clark. They were big guys there. One was like uh, six five, three hundred fifty pounds, 
Sailor Clark was a ball-headed guy with a beard. Other guy looked something like me, you know. And he was uh, uh, there was a village, and Jack Wentworth and this uh, guy named Johnny Reed, with a, uh, who was a police officer. He was also a student that was graduated and would help out with the training and help out on the shows on Thursday night, just get a workout. And mm-hmm. I got so involved when they're beating up uh, the good guys that I poked my brother. My younger brother came with me. I poked him, and I ended up, uh, let's get him. And I, he said, you get him. <laughs> and I jumped up, and I don't even remember doing it, really, but I went up there. And the guy was uh, on the side of the ring, and I reached up, and poked him in the stomach real hard. I guess I hit him pretty hard because he went down to his knee. <laughs> I see his partner come along, Santa Clark, get the torn out of the ring. He came around, and I picked up a chair and hit him over the head with it, and laid him out, put him, picked him up by his uh, cuff like he had his straps around his for his trunks, and put him up against the wall, and I was punching him. Well, I know some of the wrestlers told me later they thought I was, you know, part of the wrestling show because I was <laughs> a big guy and everything like that, in shape. And they, they kind of had seen me around, so they thought maybe I was part of it or something. I wasn't. I was just got excited. <laughs> Here I was laying it into these guys, and uh, they had to come in, Jack and his partner, a bunch of the boys in the back, and pull me off of this guy and tell me to get out of there, to come back the next day. Next day was when I was starting the wrestling school, and I ended up uh, coming into the school and uh, found it strange. There's nobody else around. Just Jack went with myself. He said, get your stuff on, kid. I said, okay, uh, maybe these guys are just laying it in here. And uh, pretty soon I heard some racket in the other dressing room. And I was uh, out in the ring by this time warming up. And uh, I guess this is the guy I was going to train me, I figured, you know. So I said, man, he's a noisy guy. So out comes this guy. And it's a guy I hit over the head with the chair. Put his head, and he was bad. Or at least he was acting like he was bad because he came in that ring and he was yelling at me. And I guess he was trying to scare me. And, but I... I'd been in a few fights, you know, with my brothers and, and bars by the time was when I first started uh, getting the idea of wrestling as a teenager. Uh, even underage, I'd go in and have two or three beers in the bar and try to get in a fight thinking, well, if I got in the newspaper the next day, the promoters all over the country would see me, uh, you know, this guy beat up on guys. But after I got my jaw jacked a few times, I figured that would be a better way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, that was my, in, in uh, you know, just a welcome into the wrestling school, you might say. Induction, yep. you know, but uh, uh, learned the hard way. You learned all we face you, Father. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we're here on right now. I even pulled off the Russian beer. You're listening to Fox Sports Radio 1340. Uh, so you, you you went out there, went and smartened up a little bit, and went out there straight shoot fighting. Uh, when you first came out into the world of professional wrestling, you had the name of Red McNulty. You know, uh, you had red hair, right. I, I believe. I guess you had a full head full of hair back then. Had you built from uh, Dublin, Ireland, uh, you looked a little bit more Irish back then, what you might say. That's what they told me. Yeah, I think uh, Jack Wentworth gave me the name. He says, hey, so you got to have a wrestling name. Stop watching wrestle under your own name. So starting off like this, you get beat up, then you doesn't mean there as much. So being I was uh, had, uh, been adopted, I ended up saying, well, okay, what do you think? He says, uh, how about uh, Red McNulty? you got red hair. You look like an Irishman. We'll call you the Irish rogue. The rogue, that's what they called me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I started out, and I was just good, great, whatever. And uh, I understood that, you know, what he meant was that if I wasn't experienced, I'd probably get beat up, and you don't want to, uh, you know, more of a loss record than a win record. So I ended up going for that, and it was uh, really a smart move because uh, – I just wrestled around the Toronto area for uh, a couple of years. Matter of fact, it got to 63, and that's uh, when I seen Bruno San Martino become champion. And mm-hmm. I said, oh, man, I want to be just like this guy. <laughs> big, big Italian, 290, you know, that uh, uh, lift weights and uh, was a strong man. And uh, I said, I want to be just like this guy. You know, I want to build up and try to be on him. Just to find out, uh, just a couple months after that, a few months after that, uh, Jack Wentworth called down, put my name in the hat, I think, and there was one guy that got sick for a trip to 
Pittsburgh to do television where Bruno, I guess, uh, out of uh, the East Coast, uh, Vince McMahon, Worldwide Wrestling Federation, uh, he had uh, come down to the Pittsburgh area to do a television. Later on, uh, Bruno ended up uh, owning that uh, area there, the Pittsburgh area, as far mm-hmm. as uh, promotion. And uh, so they had to go down there to take this Bull Johnson's place. And, uh, man, I was in the dressing room, and uh, I remember being excited. Here I'm going to wrestle. I'm going to be wrestling on TV. And, man, I, what, what am I going to do? i got to look good out there and all this stuff, you know, that I don't know what to do. And then the guy came in, they gave, they gave us a rundown because he used to do more than one tape. He used to do two, three tapes. And he said, this first tape you're going to be against uh, the champ. Bruno, oh, my, I got excited. Bruno Sabatino, I'm going to be wrestling on the TV. So uh, after that, the other guys heard. And uh, while I was waiting for my match to come up, they came up to me, some of the old timers and were pulling my leg, really. They're playing a joke on me. They ended up saying, uh, look, kid, what you have to do, he always goes down. I understand he ended up uh, hurting somebody in the ring when he was sparring. Uh, when he's learning wrestling, and ever since then he prayed for his uh, opponent and himself not to get any injuries. Pray to God, you know. So mm-hmm. he said, when he goes down, do that. What you need to do is attack him because you'll have his back towards you. Beat him up. Maybe get the, some shots in there. I said, okay, you know. I listened to these guys, you know. <laughs> and I, that's what I did in the match. I'll never forget uh, Bruno's face looking up at me because I, I, you know, I was. Just started right out of the wrestling school, and I wasn't what you call Polish. I was a big kid, about 260 at this time, and I was laying the punches in. You know, anybody's best press, 500, squat, you know, you you like right. to be pretty strong. Here I am kicking him hard, punching him hard, and uh, it didn't take him long, though. He, I guess he figured, I better put this guy away or else he's going to kill me. Or, so he got up, and I remember firing back on me and throwing me around like a rag doll, and, and then, uh, of all things, Comrade, he put me in a bear hug, the Russian bear hug, to beat me. <laughs> it's all to me, Comrade. It's all to me, yeah. move. You know, and then later on, you know, later on, your name from uh, went from Ray McNulty to the Russian bear. Uh, who gave you the name Ivan Kolov? Oh, that was uh, the Montreal office. After I left the Toronto area there, I had wrestled there quite a, quite a few times. Matter of fact, I got a trip to the New York area, Madison Square Garden and wrestled the whole week, like about five days. And my first match was against big Dr. Bill Miller, and I wrestled Puglisi, and uh, a couple other guys who was in there around that time. And I remember uh, I ended up getting to the guards too late because I was supposed to go down, get there early, go down for electrocardiograms, so I couldn't wrestle. But I ended up, uh, after that trip to, to New York, uh, it, it was great, too, because, uh, Bruno showed a lot of class there. I remember he, my star was, he was uh, defending his title but against Mike Zucuna that night, and uh, he ended up, uh, man, exercising in the, the weight room or in the dressing room uh, before the match. And I said, it was like a workout. And I was saying, man, this guy's great, you know, great shape. And uh, after the match and, uh, that uh, I was supposed to be on, or Kate Diamond of the match, they came up to and said, uh, we understand you didn't get out to see the doctor. You don't have your uh, electrocardiogram. I said, no. So they ended up saying, well, I couldn't wrestle. So uh, Bruno came up there. I was upset because they're paying me nightly. You know, I think I was getting like $500 for the whole five days. But that was good money back then. Guys yeah. starting out, you know, for me. So it'd be, I guess like today, probably $500 a night, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. Five hundred dollars for the whole day. Hundred dollars a night, and uh, this is a class that Bruno had. He went in his own pocket and he came back because he seen I was really upset because I wasn't getting my money that night. And he uh, came back to me and gave me a fifty dollar bill. He said, Shh, "Just take that." I took oh, wow. the money, of course. And uh, that was sure go show you the kind of class that Bruno had. You know, he, yeah. uh, he didn't know me. Just. Uh, I, he didn't even remember wrestling on TV or nothing. I don't know if anybody <laughs> told him that, but uh, he didn't sound like he he remembered or nothing. But he went and did that. From there, I left. Uh, got, when I got back to the Hamilton area, of course, I uh, settled up with uh, uh, the Jack Wentworth because the deal was I give him 10% of whatever I make for the first year and uh, after I graduate. And 
this was it the first year, so I then went down, gave in, explained to him that I didn't get paid the last night, but I did get fifty dollars. And I paid him, you know, so he wouldn't be upset with me and keep finding me some matches. Anyway, I had, I ended up leaving there one day, packed up the car, took off and sold the car in Ottawa, went to see some of my family up there and took the train to the West Coast. Three days and two nights. Got up there, I remember drinking all the way there with some students who were on the train going out there to attend college, I guess. And I uh, got out there, and on the street one day as I was walking around, I ran into the Tolis brothers, Chris and John Tolis, which was mm-hmm. wrestling, that had wrestled in the Hamilton area. And I went up to them and I said, I, I'm Ray McDonald, I uh, from uh, Jack Wentworth School in Hamilton. And, oh, yeah, they didn't know it right away. Well, Jack, and I said, look, uh, I'd like to know who the booker is, promoter. They lined me right up with them. And, uh, long story short, I ended up staying there about two and a half years. And I got to wrestle like once or twice a week, and then pretty soon it was three or four nights a week. And, uh, and then the last year or something, I was wrestling every night. And matter of fact, guys like Dutch Savvy, McLaren Brothers, Don Leo Jonathan, they ended up uh, putting in a word for me, and I got a trip to over to Japan. Uh, Baba was the wrestler over there, and you know, mm-hmm. in those days, I ended up uh, going on my first trip in '67 over to Japan. And Jacques Rougeau, one of the Rougeau brothers, uh, the brother to the promoter uh, in uh, Montreal, was over there wrestling. And uh, we became friends, I could talk, and just, you know, visiting, and was over there for, I think, six week tours. So I ended up doing pretty good over there, and uh, ended up. Uh, making friends with Jockey. He came up to me one day and he says, hey, I got an idea. Would you come into Montreal? Maybe you're like, as a Russian, you look a lot like that guy in, in uh, you know, the Soviet Union, uh, Lenin. You know, if you would shave your hand, and the hair off your head, and leave the beard like that, then you make a good Russian. By this time, I'm about 300 pounds, and, uh, you know, they're impressed with my wrestling. And mm-hmm. I said, yeah, you kidding me? New York second. <laughs> Well, it's mm-hmm. possible, I guess. That's even faster, you know. Right. But anyway, I, I permitted about that. He got right on the phone, and just on his word, he ended up booking me there for about four months later. And uh, after I left uh, Japan, went back to British Columbia, and uh, on the way across in Calgary, Alberta, and wrestled with Stu Hart's organization, Brad Hart, those guys were just little kids then. And, uh, Stayed there about a month altogether, waiting to went to the Montreal area for my time to start. Even uh, Buddy Roberts of the Freebirds uh, were friends from the street, I think, and the Broadway gym in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, worked out together and were doing some bouncing together at clubs and that. We ended up uh, becoming friends, and uh, I talked him into coming up to Calgary, and he came out there, and uh, Stu booked him a few times, and and he came to Montreal with me, and I got a book there, too. And uh, But that was the start, going to Montreal. And, uh, oh, how exciting but that was, you know, the trip coming across there was something to tell. I tell a lot of these stories in my book, so I'm not uh, hitting on a lot of them. But, man, I had to stop and see my brothers again, a uh, big family, you know. And mm-hmm. Hamilton, I went through there to go to Montreal. Of course, a big party, and I had to mention to them that I had to shave my, my hair off my head. No, they're all, all of a sudden, they're all barbers. So they, uh, after about a dozen beers each, they decided to uh, shave my head. And I got up next day, and I had a roll of toilet paper all over my head. There, every <laughs> spot was bleeding. And uh, then I said, uh, it was going into the winter time, so I didn't have, you know, my head was white. The rest of me, I had a tan. But <laughs> because of the hair, they changed off. But I showed up in Montreal, and I guess they liked what they see because, uh, we ended up, uh, the first night I was there, I ended up uh, wrestling against the guy that became my manager later, Tony Angelo. And the story was like he was, came out at the interview and he said, I want to wrestle this guy to see if he knew how to wrestle because I've, I've wrestled 30 years and I figured by me wrestling him I could see what he's like. And I ended up beating this Tony Angelo and uh, so he was impressed. He, came, he wanted to manage me. So that was uh, the start of me having a manager there, and, and they nice. ended up uh, calling me in the office, and, well, we've got to give you a name here because, uh, uh, you know, the Kent wrestler did a spectacle. I didn't even realize it at the time, but when we're 
in Montreal Wrestling coming in from Vancouver six weeks later. So for mm. a couple of weeks, I was being shown on the English Channel uh, as uh, Red McDonald's on the other channel as uh, Ivan Kola, and nobody seemed to recognize me. Because oh, I had wow. my hand in the cave, and they figured, well, I can't be the same guy, because, you know, he's on that channel, and he's on this channel, you know. So, <laughs> so I guess he confused them, and that just looked polite to get. Hold that right there. We're going to take a quick commercial break, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Wrestling Marks of Excellence. When we come back, more with Ivan Koloff. We're going to talk about he, the great and vast of managers that he had. And we're going to talk about January 18, 1971. If you don't know about that date, ladies and gentlemen, you're not a true wrestling fan. You're listening to us here on the Wrestling Marks of Excellence on Fox Sports Radio 1340. And we'll be right back after this commercial break. K&L Barbecue at 1410 Maple Street inside Cavalier Square, Hopewell. Wants you to know they have great specials on the daily menu, such as hamburger steaks, grilled chicken, a lightly fried chicken sandwich, and of course, the best chicken and dumplings in the Tri-Cities. And don't forget about their world-famous barbecue and sauce. Dine in or carry out at K&L Barbecue. Call 458-4241. That's 458-4241 for K&L Barbecue. Hello, my name is Andy Clark, and I'm an agent with Ligon Jones Insurance Services in downtown Hopewell. I'm here to tell you that at Ligon Jones Insurance, we're dedicated to serving you. You've heard all the gimmicks and sales pitches from 800 number and online companies, and we can offer all the same options, such as accident forgiveness, disappearing deductibles, 24-hour claim service, home and auto discounts, and much, much more. What we offer that they can't is local knowledge and experience, a broader selection of companies and coverages, and personal service. When you call, email, or stop by Ligon Jones Insurance, you will speak to Lucky, Sherry, or myself, and you will not have to press one for English or wait for the next available representative. We don't just sell insurance. We back it up with great customer service. At Ligon Jones Insurance Services, we have over 60 years' experience. We all live in the Tri-Cities area, and we support many different local charities. From hot dog carts to hotels, we can cover it all. So if you want better pricing, better coverage, and better service, all from a company that gives back to the community, call Ligon Jones Insurance at 458-8522 or go to www.ligonjones.com. Hemco, a family-owned business which operates as a full-service buyer, processor, and seller. Hemco purchases, collects, processes, then remits any and all salvageable materials such as copper, brass, aluminum, stainless steel, and much more for the recycling industry. That's Hemco, Hopewell Iron and Metal Company, located at 213 South 6th Avenue, Hopewell, Virginia. For services or questions, call Hemco at 458-8514, open Monday through Fridays, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's Hemco, Hopewell Iron and Metal Company. This is referee Brian Hebner from TNA Impact Wrestling, and you're listening to Wrestling Marks of Excellence on Fox Sports Radio 1340. Fox Sports 1340 AM presents to you WMER, Wrestling Marks of Excellence Radio, starring The Firm, J-Lo, Nephew, Corey, and Dr. D, bringing you the latest up-to-date information on professional wrestling and sports entertainment. Now, live from the Fox Sports 1340 studios in Hopewell, Virginia. Hey, welcome back, wrestling fans. Welcome back to the Wrestling Muscle Excellency on Fox Sports Radio 1340. We joined by Ivan. We joined by Ivan Koloff with Ivan Koloff, the Russian Bear, uh, ladies and gentlemen. He's telling the story. We up. Uh, he's telling the past wrestling stories. How he became Ivan Koloff. But before we get back into Ivan Koloff, the interview with Ivan Koloff, he needs your help. We need your help. We need to see Ivan Koloff, the Russian Bear documentary, uh, be made and come to fruition. If you go to Kickstarter. Uh, dot com, ladies and gentlemen, type in Ivan Koloff, the Russian Bear. It's a documentary which is done by Michael Elliott. Uh, if you don't know who Michael Elliott is, he did the other documentaries on the Rock and Roll Express, uh, Rock and Roll Never Dies, which came out, I believe, last month, a couple months ago. Uh, and we need your support. Ivan needs your support so we can get this project out. There are a lot of wrestling stars and legends that are not currently in the WWE, that the WWE is not currently promoting or pushing, who contribute a lot to the way we see professional wrestling now, I dare to say if you're a WWE fan, you've seen the Jack Swagger and Rusev uh, storyline. But let's true, be honest and let's be true. There's no Russians like the Koloff. If it was not for Ivan and Nikita and the rest of the Koloffs, there will be no Rusev today. The, the USA and Russian heat goes way beyond uh, Alexander Rusev and Jack Swagger. It starts with Ivan Koloff. It starts with Nikita Koloff. So go to kickstarter.com. Type in Ivan Koloff, the Russian bear, 
and help get this documentary uh, finished. Very, uh, very few, very a lot of you have already supported and helped. We've got eight days to go. Please support uh, this project to get it off the ground and get it done. Ivan, once again, that's kickstarter.com. Ivan Koloff, the Russian Bear, which is done by Michael Elliott. Now, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the project, Mr. Koloff. I'm looking forward to seeing yeah. the documentary. I'm looking forward to I've been at. excited about it myself. Uh, you know, I, I've been doing autographs for charity for the last 20 years and uh, Children's Miracle and such and different uh, stores. And, and uh, I've had so many people ask me about my career, the things that happened, you know, the riots and the fights and the people attacking me and uh, the, the different the wrestlers fighting among themselves and all this stuff. And, you know, there's so many stories that I figured that uh, when uh, Elliot uh, – Michael Elliott uh, approached me about this. I said, man, that'd be great because I think a lot of people would be interested in it. And, uh, th- and I thank all the people out there that uh, would co- t- contribute to this even a little bit because it would help. It would all add up. Uh, that, uh, and I think there's a little bit of a reward in it, the fact that you get a tape or something like that or autograph picture and stuff like this uh, that he's got worked into the, the, the whole deal as far as uh, – being able to be a contributor to it. I understand uh, we have uh, one executive producer already that uh, put in a, a large amount, but uh, he ended up, uh, uh, I guess, uh, it's a good friend of mine, <laughs> Joey, at Friendly Box Breaks. He ends up uh, going online, and I guess he has a lot of these cards and stuff, and he's out there where people end up buying cards or bidding on cards and uh, get the surprise card in the package and, He's out of the Hampton area. Of course, I remember Hopewell, man, going up there wrestling in that Richmond area all, so many times. Rock and Roll Express, Jimmy Valiant, Road Warriors, Rock and Roll Express, Wahoo. Oh, man, I could go on uh, so yeah, many different superstars, you know. It's great. Great, man. We'd love to love you have, you have you back in this area. Um, you know, before we the commercial break, we were talking about January 18, uh, 1971. Uh, how did you and when did you get the call to know that that was going to be the night that you were going to end Bruno San Martino's uh, seven-year reign, and how did you feel about it? Did you worry about well, the heat getting out of the building? Oh, man, yeah, I was really nervous that day. I mean, even though I had been wrestling at that time for about ten years, eight years anyway, but the wrestling school was ten years old again. So it was like uh, really uh, still, you, you're nervous, the butterflies. But that's good, though, because it, it keeps you right on, on uh, the sharp edge, you know, type thing that, you're thinking and your, your adrenaline's going and it makes you uh, really uh, pumped up, ready to, to go. I ended up uh, being in the Montreal area. I won the tag team championship, the singles championship, lost them, won them back again, the riots and all this stuff. I had a great time. Uh, I had more time. Uh, maybe I'll explain more one of the other stories in the, uh, the, in the video. But it ended up that I ended up uh, – uh, meet Captain Lou Albano up in Montreal. Him and his partner, Tony Altamore, the Sicilians, came in up there. And that's the first time I met Captain Lou Albano. I heard of him, seen him on television and such. And I said, man, this is exciting. And he ended up uh, going back and was impressed by me. Went back and told Vince McMahon that uh, this guy, this Russian guy, would be a great opponent against uh, Bruno San Martino. And this was uh, about 68. So after I finished up in the Montreal area, they had it set for me to come into the New York area in 1969. I wrestled Bruno all around the loop for, oh, eight, ten months. Uh, man, I, won, I had some victories again, but never could get the belt off of I had a trip uh, scheduled for uh, Australia, went over there for ten weeks. When I got back to Hawaii, I got a call to come in back to wrestle Bruno again in the gardens. So I ended up coming back and wrestling Bruno, and that, that, that's so exciting, man. So here we are, the Big Apple, Madison Square Gardens, I get your hero. And uh, he's so loved by the people to this day. He's uh, still a legend, you know. Bruno was uh, undefeated seven and a half years at that time, and I think he had been hurt a bit. Now, I can imagine, because I wrestled there eight, ten months, and the rings were the boxing rings, so they're a lot harder, bigger than the wrestling ring. Main- and, uh, you know, it's easy to get hurt uh, when you got something that solid. And I figured that, I, I know I bought myself up put it pretty bad on it myself in that few months, but I know that Bruno had to be 
aching a bit. I don't know how this all came about, but they wanted me there anyway uh, for that match. And I don't know if it was because somebody got sick, uh, replacing them, or what, but they just said, as a matter of fact, we want you back for this, that if you'll come back for this, I think there'll be a spot for you for a year here. I said, well, that'd be great. So I don't want to just come back for a match and then leave again, you know. Well, uh, back in those days, you tried to stay in one area because you had to fly here and fly there. Although they had me flying around quite a bit around this time. You know, they figured they were trying to introduce me, like, to Detroit, St. Louis, and different places. And uh, so I was flying around a bit. But I figured, uh, you know, uh, I better uh, try to work a deal there to go back. So when I got there, it was... Uh, changed a bit. They, they figured they'd want me to stay for a couple of months, but that was it. But don't worry. You're going to make some good money, and uh, that's all I was interested in anyway, mainly. But uh, I ended up winning the belt. And that, that was so much of a surprise, not only to me, but to the fans. And the referee, too, <laughs> Bruno was shocked, I guess, because he said that he couldn't figure out what happened. I mean, it stunned him enough that it was like, you know, okay, man, or this guy got a one, two, three on me, but why are the people so quiet? I mean, was, you could hear a pin drop. Well, no, were, you, was, were, were, you scared, were you scared to get out the building that night? Were you scared? Do you think that they were going to riot because you had just beat Bruno San Martino? Oh, yeah, definitely. At that point, I didn't think of it right then, but I figured that because I've been in riots before, you know, when they fill the ring with chairs, and I figured that it sounded something like that. So I was literally, but I was saying to the referee, where's the belt? Raise my hand so I can get out of here. And the referee raised my hand, but he says, no belt. Now, later, later. So she talked me into it, so I left. Got the belt later, but uh, looked up back through the curtains after a few minutes, and the people were still very quiet, but you could hear some crying, people saying, Bruno, you're still our champ. You'll get it back. You'll always be our champ, stuff like this, you know. And people crying. And Bruno said that when he, was, uh, you know, looked around, he came up, and uh, it was too late to one, two, three. It was like uh, the time he could push off, push me off. And it was like, why are the people so quiet? He said, did something happen or something get hurt or something? You know, but he couldn't figure it out. And it was just a shock to the people. Then after this, we go down to the uh, basement of the uh, – Madison Square Gardens is Captain and I because we're catching our cab out of the bottom. They used to have the main event on halfway through the, the show so that the, the the bad guy could get away because the people always hot at then and uh, before the crowd broke. But uh, the people who said what was going on and wanted to get at me and a bunch of them were at the door when the cab went in. They followed him in and uh, we jumped in the cab. Uh, they started rocking the cab and Captain Amini yelled at the driver. He said, you better get out of here if you want to keep your cab because they're going to wreck it. And he did. He stepped on it, managed to convince the people to get out of the road and uh, got out of there. But even the next day, Captain said that he was in a friend's uh, store and uh, they were talking about the match and how uh, Bruno got beat up and uh, the, the guys that was in the store, some customers didn't like the way they were talking about it and ended up punching the owner of the store. <laughs> Captain told me this. Yeah, so uh, I guess there was a lot of talk around town because of Bruno get beat after seven and a half years, and, and it was a treat for me for sure. It really made my career, you know, Definitely. to win that ball. Yeah, yeah you, but you didn't keep the title long. You, you held it for maybe about three or four weeks, uh, and then you end up dropping it to uh, Pedro Morales. Was there any reason behind you dropping it to Pedro Morales, or they just wanted to give it on? Give it to somebody else. I mean, you and Bruno never really had your rematch per se, yeah. or well, the uh, Bruno never had his rematch. Yeah, did you, did you ever see the finish uh, with the match with Pedro and I? Yes, yes. Well, if you remember, I had him in a full Nelson. Yep. And I was going to run his head in the turnbuckle. What was the turnbuckle? It was a smart move he did. He reached up with his legs and kicked the top turnbuckle, keeping me off balance backwards. Mm-hmm. And I dropped my hand from the full Nelson down to a waist lock, and I bridged. But in yep. bridging, I'm, I'm still on the offense, and I'm holding him there. He's on the defense. But they count my shoulders down. Like I said to the referee, how can you do that? I mean, it's on film. Cause it's, <laughs> they didn't film it themselves. That's why they probably didn't, because 
they wanted to find a reason to get it out to Pedro because they were convinced that an uh, ethnic type of uh, champion w- it was going to draw more money uh, with Pedro having it rather than a uh, Russian that everybody hated. And they're afraid of probably riots every night and such. So anyway, uh, nothing I could do about it. <laughs> I went back and complained, but uh, that was it. That was yeah. it. That's it. They won. Hey, you know, I think a rematch with you and Pedro, I mean, you and San Martino would have drew more money and drew more heat than uh, uh, than Pedro Morales and yourself. But then we find you, you take a trip down to, you know, Georgia Championship Wrestling down in NWA. Uh, you also mm-hmm. had a stop in Mid-South Wrestling. Uh, we'll get there for a minute. I, I watched a couple of Mid-South doing research for this, and I think one of the most, besides the Bruno San Martino uh, fight and when you went in the champion, one of the other nights that you had one of the most heat was when you – a hot sub Eddie Gilbert and Nikita uh, put the Russian flag on Cowboy Bill Watts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we didn't use the flag a lot other than uh, television maybe or something like that. But, you know, because yeah, they're a little leery about the arenas too much. But, uh, yeah, that was uh, a heat getter to say the least because uh, anybody like Bill Watts, Dusty Rhodes, or any of those really loved uh, at around that time, and you put the Russian flag on it, it's like an insult, you know. <laughs> and uh, they're the Americans, and they're the people used to chant, like, USA, USA, all of this. And, uh, man, we got to fight our way out of the lot of the buildings. So that's why I always kept the big partners by taking partners so I could uh, hide behind them on the way out. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah Did you- it was uh, that, for that reason, you know, we just – I want to take it uh, one notch higher to get that extra heat. You know, the people want to see you beat up that much more than. Definitely, you know, you always got you always got a lot of heat going up, and I know you always enjoyed being the heel uh, in the world of professional wrestling. Then you got an NWA. We saw a lot of matches in NWA with you, uh, Dusty Rhodes, Nikita, uh, and going on. But you alluded to earlier. Uh, that you had some managers, and I want to go there for a minute. You don't have some great managers in the days. A lot of guys uh, that that been your manager. You had Gary Hart, you uh, Captain Lou Albano, um, you had Freddie mm-hmm. Blassi. Uh, those guys, some of the great managers of our day and age. Uh, which one of you, one of these guys were you know that you enjoyed uh, managing you, and who did you ride down the road with a lot um, when you were uh, traveling the road in territories? Well, just driving down the road, it was hard, like in a territory like New York, because like the captain lived in a different area that I lived in, but uh, I would definitely ride with somebody I got along with and somebody that uh, uh, lived in my, my area rather than go way out of the road or catch them on the way up or they catch me on the way up to a town. And that way it would make it more convenient to put the expenses a bit. But uh, as far as uh, getting along and liking them, I don't think there's one I didn't get along with and we liked to, even to the point of having the uh, Japanese uh, manager, Atari, for a while down in uh, Florida, Saito and I, and, uh, man, it was just uh, the idea that these guys knew what their job was and, and they were good at it. Uh, Gary Hart over in Australia and uh, over here, Fred, uh, all those guys, guys you mentioned, Tony Angelo, the Captain Lou, man, the Fred Blasi. I was an honor to have Fred Blasi out there, too, because uh, he's a... Uh, I, I used to watch him from California you know, a lot, biting the people and everything. <laughs> He's a character. Yeah, I, I, think, I think one of the managers I think I remember seeing you with first, and I'm a young guy, was with Paul Jones. I always thought Paul Jones was one of the most underrated managers that were. He had a great stable at the time, uh, shot mm-hmm. in the watch league and all those guys. Uh, you know, uh, Paul Jones, was he as a genius as most people think he was? Well, you know, he was very experienced because I, I met him uh, in Calgary uh, and around before I got here. He had already been wrestling a bit. Uh, he was a pretty good boxer, too. He uh, like uh, competed like Golden Gloves and that. A lot of people didn't know that because he had those short arms. So I think he'd do good, but I guess he was pretty clever at it, the way he'd <laughs> uh, do his boxing and everything. But, uh, yeah, as a manager, yeah, he, he was great, too. And I, I really think that uh, the idea of... Uh, Knowing when to uh, nudge it up, like you know, riot to the don't you don't want them to riot. You want them to want to come back and see it again. You know the matches. And, uh, Paul would uh, inject himself enough as a manager as far as his team goes. 
but uh, not all the emphasis is on him. Some managers try to put all the emphasis on themselves. That's what happens, and the, the people want to see him get beat up, and that's not what you want. You want the, the people who want to see the, the other team come and beat this team up, the, the manager's team, you know. But anyway, Paul, you know, he was great. Uh, we ended up uh, being partners for a while and then uh, fight to get you. When I first came to the Mid-Atlantic area in Charlotte, that I was against Paul Jones. It was for the TV bill. And then I left for the IWA, and it uh, came back. That was a bad move, by the way, IWA. And I regret that because uh, even though they promised me twice the money, it was just uh, a bad decision because it didn't last and uh, they weren't uh, sticking to what they had said. So it ended up, uh, it was all right, but I got I was trying to get away from them. <laughs> you know. But, uh, yeah, Paul was great. Uh, all, all the managers, I think, real good. Of course, the, when Nikita came in later on, I went away, came back like Florida, Georgia, uh, Japan, New York. I'd uh, take off and go, and I'd always come back to, from uh, 1974 right on through to 89. When I quit the WCW, I ended up uh, coming back there and go to another area for six months or something, but always come back there. And uh, with uh, the different teams and the guys that were there from, 74 on, Rick Flair, uh, Wahoo, the Black Jacks, uh, Rufus R. Jones, Junkyard, uh, so many guys. Paul Jones being a steady guy there, Johnny Weaver, and uh, Sweet Hanson, Rick Hawk, all of that. It was uh, quite a crew in the Mid-Atlantic area. And uh, I come back, uh, Nikita was uh, like a uh, second win for me, you might say, because I ended up uh, being there several times and then now to come in and uh, be wrestling. Don, Don Cardoodle is my partner. Uh, Ray Stevens first. Don Cardoodle, uh, we were holding the belts and then ended up losing them. And then me and Crusher, Khrushchev, and, and then the rock and roll came in and they cheated us out of our TV. <laughs> so actually they, they won the match on TV and that really made the rock and roll express there. Then uh, later on, the uh, Road Warriors, and uh, to have the key to come in right at that time with big guys like that to wrestle again was uh, was good for me because it not only made us stronger because I, I, I do enough to keep the key to strong, the mystique on him, you know, the credibility on him. And uh, if I got beat up, uh, the people had seen it before, but the key to was like an instructable, you know, type thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it did yeah. last quite a while, from 83 right on up to... Uh, 87 or so, 88, and then he went as a superpower with Dusty Rhodes. Mm-hmm. Definitely, he double cross uh, Kula. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah, definitely double cross you. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Wrestling Marshall X on Fox Sports Radio 1340. Are uh, we sitting with and we're talking to Ivan Koloff? Uh, the Russian Bear. Uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, he needs your support. We need you to help Ivan Koloff and Mike Elliott get this documentary out. Uh, so please go to kickstarter.com uh, backslash Ivan Koloff, uh, kickstarter.com Ivan Koloff, and uh, help him out and support him. Let's get this documentary off. A great a great uh, person, a great producer who does documentary, great director. If you not, if you have not seen uh, Rock and Roll Will Never Die, the Rock and Roll Express, a documentary, uh, you need to check that out, which is also done by Michael Elliott. Uh, check it out as well. But Ivan Koloff has a documentary coming out. He needs your support. Go to kickstarter.com backslash Michael Koloff. We're going to take a quick commercial break, but we'll come back with being on overtime. So if you want to hear part two of this segment uh, with Ivan Koloff, you need to go to firmwrestling.com. Uh, that's one thing you need to go to firmwrestling.com. Click on the podcast banner uh, and click on uh, Ivan Koloff interview. Uh, part two. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here on the Wrestling Market Excellence on Fox Sports Radio 1340. Uh, if the Wizards were here, if you're not confirmed, consider yourself denied. We've got the exec in the house to close us out for this portion of our interview with Ivan Koloff. End of story. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back after this uh, commercial play- break only on Blog Talk Radio or from Wrestling.com. K&L Barbecue at 1410 Maple Street inside Cavalier Square, Hopewell. Wants you to know they have great specials on the daily menu, such as hamburger steaks, grilled chicken, a lightly fried chicken sandwich, and of course, the best chicken and dumplings in the Tri-Cities. 
And don't forget about their world's famous barbecue and sauce. Dine in or carry out at K&L Barbecue. Call 458-4241. That's 458-4241 for K&L Barbecue. Hello, my name is Andy Clark, and I'm an agent with Ligon Jones Insurance Services in downtown Hopewell. I'm here to tell you that at Ligon Jones Insurance, we're dedicated to serving you. You've heard all the gimmicks and sales pitches from 800 number and online companies, and we can offer all the same options, such as accident forgiveness, disappearing deductibles, 24-hour claim service, home and auto discounts, and much, much more. What we offer that they can't is local knowledge and experience, a broader selection of companies and coverages, and personal service. When you call, email, or stop by Ligon Jones Insurance, you will speak to Lucky, Sherry, or myself, and you will not have to press one for English or wait for the next available representative. We don't just sell insurance. We back it up with great customer service. At Ligon Jones Insurance Services, we have over 60 years' experience. We all live in the Tri-Cities area, and we support many different local charities. From hot dog carts to hotels, we can cover it all. So if you want better pricing, better coverage, and better service, all from a company that gives back to the community, call Ligon Jones Insurance at 458-8522 or go to www.ligonjones.com. Hemco, a family-owned business which operates as a full-service buyer, processor, and seller. Hemco purchases, collects, processes, then remits any and all salvageable materials such as copper, brass, aluminum, stainless steel, and much more for the recycling industry. That's Hemco, Hopewell Iron and Metal Company, located at 213 South 6th Avenue, Hopewell, Virginia. For services or questions, call Hemco at 458-8514, open Monday through Fridays, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's Hemco, Hopewell Iron and Metal Company. This is referee Brian Hebner from TNA Impact Wrestling, and you're listening to Wrestling Marks of Excellence on Fox Sports Radio 1340. Fox Sports 1340 AM presents to you WMER, Wrestling Marks of Excellence Radio, starring The Firm, J-Lo, Nephew, Corey, and Dr. D, bringing you the latest up-to-date information on professional wrestling and sports entertainment. Now, live from the Fox Sports 1340 studios in Hopewell, Virginia. Back on, all right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Marks of Essence here on Fox Sports Radio 1340 or com or Blog Talk Radio, which one ever, whichever one you're listening to us on, or iTunes Radio. We're sitting here with the Russian Bear Ivan Kolov, the man who ended Bruno San Martino's long seven year reign as WWF champion. Uh, uh, Ivan Kolov is one of the most hated. Guys, and professional wrestling. Everybody talks about this, and y'all may steal it all you want to, but you heard it here first on the Wrestling Marks of Excellence. Everybody talks about the Undertaker streak being one of the greatest streaks ever to end, but I dare to say the man who broke Bruno San Martino's streak has more heat than Brock Lesnar will ever have for breaking the WWE, sure. for breaking uh, Undertaker's streak, because people, this streak is forgotten about. Most people don't talk about it. Last time it was relevant was when uh, CM Punk was champion for over four and some days. But, Mr. Koloff, you are a person who broke a streak that would never, just like the Undertaker streak, never, ever in professional wrestling ever uh, be uh, set broken again. No one would ever hold a WWE title or WWF title, whichever you want to call it, for seven years ever again. And you was the gentleman who broke the streak. Yeah. You know, that's it. What an honor, especially when somebody is like a legend like Bruno San Martino is so well loved and still to this day. You know, people uh, admired him for so long as champion, and uh, I was no exception. He was, <laughs> as a youngster, I uh, was cheering for Bruno myself, and uh, just to uh, get a chance to wrestle him and win the belt, wow, it's like a dream come true. You know, yeah. now to have a documentary made, too, about uh, my life, and uh, maybe it'll all come around, and uh, we'll get to have me in the Hall of Fame next year, maybe, and Hey man, you you you're a genius. That's what we was rooting for. That's why I was that was my next question. I'm rooting for you to be in yeah. the Hall of Fame this year. We, you need to be well, in the I, Hall of Fame. If I if That'd I can great. interject here, if I can interject here, Mr. Koloff, and uh, what's up, what's up, uh, uh, Mark Nation? This is the exact Doctor D. Um, there is a Facebook that is advertising your your induction, and they've been talking about it. I don't know if. You, I don't know mm-hmm. if you uh, have a Facebook yourself, but um, there mm-hmm. is a campaign on Facebook uh, to induct you into the Hall of Fame. And yes, I'm still a, I'm still spearheading that as well, like we had talked about a couple of years ago. And the thing is, I'm glad you had mentioned it, 
about the Hall of Fame because it seems like since we had talked last, you had resurfaced in WWE, especially on the 50th anniversary DVD. But um, what kind of talks have they had with have WWE had with you since that DVD? Uh, I haven't heard from the WWE at all about uh, you know the documentary or anything like that. But I did see that they put something up on their site, uh, having my story up there, uh, not my story, but uh, my picture up there and uh, a mm-hmm. small bio of me up there saying who I was and everything. And that's surprising because I haven't seen anything up till now. And to see that up there, it's encouraging for me that maybe they're going to. It's probably Bill After behind because I think he's one of the writers for. Uh, it's up there, but uh, whoever okay. it is, it's got to have the blessings of uh, uh, Triple H or Vince himself before it gets out yeah. there. So maybe that's a good sign. Yeah, that would be the yeah. alumni. That would be the alumni page, and you would, and you definitely should be on the alumni page. You're the you're the third WWE champion ever, and the th- and I want to talk about uh, also being a part of. Help of helping to get this documentary off the ground because yes, I did purchase the Rock and Roll Express and I'm looking forward to purchasing as well the DVD that that uh, Elbow Productions have also had created about uh, about the Jim Crockett uh, Promotions DVD, which I will mm-hmm. uh, hopefully obtain uh, pretty soon. Were you a part of that as well? I believe so. I think they did DVD specifically. I can't remember. I remember them asking me to do it, to talk about it or something, but I don't know if it's uh, – I haven't seen the video yet, but, uh, that, yeah, that's okay. great. I think that they put something like that, that, that together. I think it's uh, re- really good because uh, I'm very glad the fans back then, so many that watched it back in those days and to have something like that put together, I think it's uh, not only an honor to us wrestlers, but it's uh, I think it's smart business on their part just to – have that. I understand one of the levels of this documentary that uh, Michael was, Elliot is doing that uh, you could end up getting uh, all three of the, the DVDs of mine, the Rock and Roll, and this one with the NWA or something. Like that. So that, that's okay. great. Okay. I don't want. Yeah. Okay. I, I think Bernie Pop you- getting a large level up there is really half out. Man, I just encourage and just thank everybody that uh, even a little bit. Uh, a little donation it really helps uh, put it together, and a little bit, a little. That's why you eat an elephant, right? A little bit at a time. And <laughs> uh, I think the, this is something that's necessary. The way talking to Michael, you know, because he does have uh, quite an expense in putting this together. But then he gets the videos and uh, gets all the people together, do interviews and all this stuff. Uh, I guess uh, it, it costs some money. So uh, really appreciate your help out there. It's an honor. To, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, when you're talking about the NWA, and there's a period that 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 a lot of people don't uh, really uh, mention, and you had mentioned it, you had touched on it earlier, and I have been watching nothing but YouTubes and YouTubes and many YouTubes of classic NWA matches and, and NWA worldwide, mid-Atlantic footage, and Georgia Championship Wrestling featuring yourself, but you had touched about – being part of the um, Mid-Atlantic area right before um, the the big feud that you and Nikita had had with uh, Don Cranoodle, and, and before and this this was actually well actually let me uh, uh, rewind back uh, for a sec before your turn on your your heel turn on Don Cranoodle. Well, you was always a heel, but uh, you turned on Don Cranoodle after losing the World Tag Team titles to Dusty and and the Raging Bull, but but there was a point in time where you were brought into the Mid Atlantic, not just as a superstar, but it seemed like you you were more of a mentor, especially when you were the Mid Atlantic champion. You were working with the the young rookie known as Angelo Mosca Jr. Tell us, take us back to that time when you worked with uh, young Angelo Mosca Jr. Oh wow, yeah, uh, you know I've been around. His dad, you know, Angelo Oscar himself, uh, quite right. a bit over the years of wrestling. And uh, Angelo's a big, just a tough guy, strong football player and wrestler, as far as that goes. But then to get his yeah. son, and there was no rigid. He was like a guy 6'4", 260, you know, and uh, great shape, lean, 
And, uh, man, uh, uh, without a doubt, he'd have the strongest uppercut, you know, elbow uppercut in the business uh-huh. because my jaw the whole time I wrestled against him, whether it was six months or a year, it was a long time, I know that, uh, night after night, man, it, it, it throw that, I don't know if it's because I was short, he was tall, and he had to get underneath me to get that thing in there. But, man, he jacked, jacked my jaw every time. He did that. I wonder how a sore jaw all the time. But uh, he was a great wrestler, that kid. He was just putting it together real good right around that time. And uh, uh, I was surprised that he didn't stick around a little longer because I think they really could have – he was really learning good and uh, he had a lot of potential, good-looking kid and everything. But he was probably pursuing college and all that and still in the process of uh, being out there. I think his dad wanted to try to push him in the wrestling because – he was obviously a great candidate for being a great athlete and everything, but, man, it was an experience every night. I had to be in shape. Matter of fact, right around that time, because I had been heavier before, I ended uh-huh. up, uh, you know, staying up around the 300 bar, 280, and uh, right around this time, I said, i got to start dropping the weight. These guys, man, they're, they're great shape, the Rock and Roll Express, and even the Road Warriors and all this, uh, yeah, i got to be able to move. <laughs> yeah. So I dropped out to 225, 230, and man, it, it did make a difference because I know after that uh, they started calling me the machine. Then they grew uh-huh. called La Machine. <laughs> so I guess it, it, I was doing the right thing by doing a lot of running and working out. But uh, oh yeah, that was quite an era in there with uh, the wrestling because it was so competitive. You know, whenever you went out there. You know, we never all had contracts like a lot of guys have today. Uh, you were mm-hmm. here with the idea, okay, you're a main event in this other territory, so we'll give you a chance here, but you better fill the seat or we're going to put somebody else in your spot. And you can't blame mm-hmm. the world for doing that. You've got a business too. So uh, I would see it, no kidding, uh, guys yeah. fight to the ring and the situation carrying on to after to the dressing room and uh, them duking it out in the dressing room, the guys. Yeah. And one guy think that they're trying to cut him out of uh, the matches or something. Like one time it was Wahoo, Don Chardine, the dressing room in Raleigh, upstairs in the dressing mm-hmm. room, so that studio. And, uh, boy, the, the voices started getting loud. And pretty soon, big, 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 they're obviously punching each other. The time I got to the, the, the other side of the dressing room where the good guys were, I think, uh, most of them were bleed. Well, who ran him? And uh, yeah. they were going at it. And I yeah. ended up, I don't know why, I was always elected to be the referee in cases like that, but I guess it was because I liked both of the guys. I did. I respected them. I didn't want them to, you know, be doing that in the dressing room, get hurt for nothing, you know. So here I am kicking their hand when they go for the groin or their hair or the eyeball or something. I'd be saying, no, no, none of that. <laughs> and, uh, but they were serious. I'd seen matches in the bars, you know, after the show was over and guys still carrying a grudge into the for the match, uh, into the bar room or into the dressing room after so uh, it was uh, intense. Uh, and the, when you had guys that uh, you didn't know, you know, you look at a guy like Dick Murdoch or uh, uh Sweet Hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You say yeah. that you think that those guys are great punchers, Roddy Garvey, yeah, they I uh, said that the hands are stolen, you know, of course he was yeah. a great puncher. But uh, the guys like Dick Murdoch and Sweet Hanson, if they, if they hit you, you knew that yeah. you were hit, you know, with the punch. Because uh, they're great punches. But I was attacked to them, I just hide behind them. Uh, Roddy Piper was something like that, too. He was uh, yeah. a good yeah. little boxer, too. And, uh, yeah. so, but it was very competitive. The, the tempers raised a lot because, you know, a lot of the arenas didn't have air conditioning and was kind of crude and guys were tired, hurt, grumpy, and, Man, it, it would <laughs> the, the fire fly sometimes. And, and uh, I'm glad I wasn't a tough guy. Too, too many guys wanted to try to beat me up. So but I've seen a lot of guys go at it. Yes, sir. You know what? I want to talk about um, you and Dusty Rose for a second because I have an old match that um, you know I heard, and I heard Gilo had uh, mentioned uh, in comparisons with you and with you uh, ending Bruno San Martino's reign to the streak, and we know The Undertaker is known for casket matches. Well, I have an old match in the 80s um, at the uh, – at the at 
as, as part of uh, Paul Bosch's promotion in Houston, and and mm-hmm. it was you and Dusty in a casket match. Was, was that considered the first casket match that 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 that, that was that ever oh. happened in wrestling? I believe so, you know, because I'd never heard of it before, and uh, uh, I think it was the late seventies to be exact. Uh, I think in okay. the late late seventies, seventy nine or something. Okay. But you're right, just heard about that here with Paul Bonds in Houston. Uh, I had uh, wrestled Dusty Rhodes, and uh, it came back like it was going to be a return type of situation. And Dusty came up, I think, with the idea. He says because uh, I was carrying that red shovel around. And every time I defeated a, uh, a big star like a Dusty Rhodes, I put a big mark on the handle. If I just insignificant guy I beat, I just put a little mark on it. And, and after a while, there was a lot of marks on it. And uh, I was bragging about how I was going to bury this American Dusty Rhodes with a shovel, and I was going to put uh, a mark on uh, the Russian side, and uh, he was uh, going to go down at the, the arena and, and used to the next show. And uh, that's a good He said, well, this uh, Russian, he, he talks a, a big talk and everything and goes uh, around carrying a chain and shovel around with him. He's going to bury his opponent. Why don't we just settle it for good? We have a casket match. I don't know if he does. He got with the promoter, uh, boss there or not, but he came back and he said, uh, uh, he kept it out of the blue, you know, with that. And he's going, we're going to have a casket out there in the ring and the falls don't count. Uh, you can pin a guy, but it don't count uh, uh, towards winning. You have to end up uh, putting the guy in the coffin. And if he, once he's in the coffin, they're going to pull him out of the ring and carry him back to the dressing room. Uh, anyway, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, I was caught in the middle of doing an interview, and they, they presented this. And of course, I, could, I can't say, no, I wasn't going to take this American eyes. Call off and accept this back gladly because I feel confident I can beat this Dusty Rhodes. American dream, the greatest of America against the greatest from Russia. Let's see who could get it done. I'll put you in that American casket and bury you for good. That's like this kind of interview. And uh, the, the people loved it, I guess. And I remember two or three falls in, in and out of the ring, uh, right. bleeding. I remember the coffin being in there. And I remember yeah. coming off the top rope, had a drink, drink over the coffin, and uh, of course, you've seen the rest of the match, so. Yes, I did. <laughs> I think that that's where they, they came up with the idea for The Undertaker and all this stuff. I think it was good. Yeah. It was good, too. Good idea. And, we'll, yeah. and, 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 and speaking on and speaking about working with Dusty as a booker, how, how would you say your, your, your relationship with Dusty was as, as, um, as, a, booker, as a booker, not just, um, an, a, not just an opponent that you had uh, successfully worked with? Uh, I always got along real good. I think it was the type of thing that we both, both knew that we had to fill the seats up. And that was the, our job. And the promoter mm-hmm. had to accept what I said. Uh, TV put us in such position that uh, the people would end up wanting to see me get beat and just to do the beating type thing. We do this, so it was the idea of uh, how you go about it. And whenever you have a guy that she had met us the first time in 68, in Montreal, Reynolds came mm-hmm. in there, and he ended up uh, uh, wrestling around the, the Montreal area. I can remember this big guy uh, with a colorful outfit on, and I was wrestling in, uh, I think, uh, in Chicoutim, but it might have been Quebec. And uh, my, my finish was an inverted backbreaker. I bent the guy over, pick him up on my shoulder, walk around. Now, you know Dusty is pretty heavy down below, big legs and big, you know, uh, on the midsection. So when okay. I went to pick him up, and he got him up on my shoulder, I had no trouble getting him up there, but <laughs> his feet that kept going. <laughs> so I ended up losing him, and he fell down, and he landed on his knee. Uh, doesn't right. claim that I had to put his leg at this time, but, uh, you know, he, he brought it up to me several times, you know, I guess it, uh, I guess to let me know that he did me a big favor back then, but... Uh, it was a, a type of thing that I've always thought he held a grudge about it or something like that. But I guess not. I don't know because he, we always got a lot. He always did stuff like I uh, was wrestling for uh, Dick the Bruiser, uh, 1976. He ended up bringing me 
into uh, Miami or uh, Florida to wrestle, flying me back. They flew me into St. Louis to wrestle, and, uh, all over the place, and they are flying me around. So uh, Dusty was doing matches against, uh, you know, him and I against each other. And uh, so we always got along with it, even from uh, him being in this area when the Nikita came in to the Charlotte, or to the Atlanta area, and of course Florida area seemed like uh, we always end up uh, not following me, but I, me following him or whatever, is that we ended up being against each other quite a bit. It was money for me, and I just never complained about it. Of course, because you know some good ideas there to promote matches, and especially when it got into the pay-per-views and everything, and you, know, you had to have some exciting stuff. I know that's why Vince has gone the way he has because he's got to keep an interest on a lot of uh, people and a big interest to get the people interested enough to pay and set at home and watch it, you know. So God bless him. <laughs> it's good. He's, he went yeah. into a new dimension, really. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Wrestling Martial Excellence Radio Overtime on the firm. Uh, we are talking with the very third WWE World Heavyweight Champion, the legendary Russian bear Ivan Kolov. Uh, go for what you know, you know. You know, you, you speak about Vince McMahon, and when you look at the WWE Network uh, that's out now for nine ninety nine, uh, you have a lot of matches on there. Uh, one of the matches I, I watched a couple of days ago was um, you and Ricky Morton from Clash of the Champions 3, the Russian chain match um, that mm-hmm. Ricky, Ricky Morton had. You know, what was the concept of the Russian chain match? Uh, how did it come up? Did it, did it derive from the, you know, Texas Bull Rope match, which is kind of the same concept? Uh, you know, how uh, did the Russian chain match come to uh, conception? Uh, when I first started with the chain match, yeah, that's back in the 70s, about the time that I came into this area, and uh, 75 or so, uh, I got to contribute that a little bit to Don Jardine, actually. He ended up uh, leaving the territory and ended up saying to because he had one match before he left uh, against Wahoo that he ended up, I guess, coming up with the idea of a chain rather than a strap match. And uh, he told me when he left, he said, uh, this is something you should take as your signature uh, match because I understand by hearing you talk about it, in Siberia and that, uh, Russia, whenever they're in uh, the camps and such, the people were in jail, they're, they they had to go out with chains on, like the chains get a gang, and if they got in fights, the inmates with each other, they had to duke it out even with the chains, and they're able to use the chain against each other. And uh, so why don't you come up with something like that? You have to drag them around the ring to win the match or something. And uh, it was a great idea. I said, yeah, man, that'd be great, so. I took him up on it. Matter of fact, he gave me that chain because he had no need for it anymore. So I owe uh, Don Jardine one there for that. Uh, I don't know if he's even with us anymore, but uh, man, I appreciated that because it uh, really did take the uh, made sense and uh, took good effect. I think even into a, the key that came on the, the scene and uh, and uh, this is a lot of change later now probably. Dozens of them made over the years because you dress with tank teams, six man, and uh, you know the people would steal them or somebody get a hold of them, and you had to get another one made. Uh, so there's a few out there, yeah. But uh, that's uh, yeah, great. I, mean, I enjoyed it very yeah, much. Yeah, great, great matches. I mean, even Nikita took on the chain matches later on, as he stated. Uh, we saw that. You know, one of the things that your Nikita and Krusha, Khrushchev did uh, that would never also never happen again. I, along with the Road Warriors and Dusty Rose, you guys had the six man uh six man titles. Uh, which I thought was pretty pretty creative and innovative at the time. Uh, you know, for the, some of my young listeners out there, explain what the six man uh, title was and how did it come to conception as well. Yeah, I think you wanted to include Devon Erickson to that and the free yeah. words and I think of, uh, us of course and probably some other teams into it. But uh I think it was a the idea that uh, being of those three of us, like Crusher, Nikita, and myself, and Don Guru for a while, it was like, uh, you know, we could represent uh, the six-man type of thing also, and it was a reason to bring these other teams in, like the Freebirds. And uh, uh, by doing that, it would uh, give more interest, I guess, to the, the whole the whole thing. 
But uh, I think it was Crockett or the booker come up with the idea of it have, being a tournament, like cup, a cup that you're going for, like a great cup, that they, like in football, but, but this would be a wrestling six-man uh, championship cup type thing. And, uh, I guess after a while it became too much to haul around, but they uh, we, we did have uh, several matches with that and some pay-per-views, I think, and uh, mm-hmm. which is like the one that had the thing with uh, Little Ricky Morton is something that had interest to it. I think that's what Paul Jones double-crossed me, right? Yep. He ended up uh, sending the Russian assassins out to beat me up or something. And they hung me over the rope or something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of crazy stuff ended up happening. But in uh, 89, I ended up quitting and uh, went to the independent circuit. And I, I think it was about 15, 18 years ago. Worked pretty steady every weekend, was just on the name. And uh, wrestled against guys like they ended up quitting like Wahoo and a bunch of other guys, even Paul Jones later on. And we ended up uh, wrestling the independent circuit. And I even still make some appearances on some of these shows, but uh, in a different way now. I ended up doing it like for the church, I think we call them crusades. But we mm-hmm. ended up having wrestling matches, then we turned it into a couple of testimonies and a little sermon, the invitation for Christ, you know. And, it really makes sense because I became a born again Christian, and it really impressed me how awesome God is. Uh, 1989, I quit the, the wrestling because I become a drug addict and alcoholic to a real dangerous extent, carrying a gun and selling the stuff, and uh, be real bold, fighting on airplanes and bars. And I'm not even a fighter. Here I am going all over the place doing this crazy stuff. I knew I needed some help to get off of the stuff, so I going around trying to do the right thing. And by 1982, I started, 92, I mean, after quitting in 89, I started even doing autographs for charity, thinking, God, well, maybe he'll bless me if I do some good things, you know. And mm-hmm. then, you know, he had it in the works because he had introduced me to Nikita. I got a call from Nikita about four la- years later after going up and down the road and throwing the stuff away and trying it on my own to quit chewing tobacco, quit the marijuana to quit the, the dope and the, the booze and all this stuff. And I just go back to it. I just throw it away and go back to it. Mm-hmm. And just like a little thing. Nikita called me one day because he had talked to me and realized that uh, I was having a struggle with this. And he called me one day and he says, uh, Uncle, what you need in your life, Uncle Ivan, he used to go, what you need in your life, you need Jesus in your life. He had right. a born again Christian. And I said, uh, what are you talking about? And he, uh, ended up being raised in church. I know uh, who Jesus is. He says, well, the devil knows who Jesus is, too. That doesn't make you a Christian. So he got my attention there and ended up, because uh, uh, I could never really remember ever, you know, asking him to come into my heart, live in me, forgive me of my sins, and, uh, acknowledging him as the Son of God. They paid the price for all my sins. Uh, so the kid had talked me into coming down to the church, and then I heard the word. I said, I, I know that this is right. I know that this is true, and I know that I got to I got to accept what He's uh, offered me. I came mm-hmm. forward that day, and as I received Jesus Christ and, and voice again, He says, "You must believe in your heart and confess your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ." And I did that. And when I did that, boom! I was down on the floor, mm-hmm. and I can remember just <laughs> like I feel right now, just coming over me, just like you know, here. And you get goosebumps all over. Yes, so sir. Over and, man, I was da- down on the floor, and I went to jump up because I was taught in wrestling, move because an elbow or a knee drops coming. And <laughs> uh, Nikita had caught me halfway down, and he says, relax, Uncle. That's the Holy Spirit. And, man, that better that been an odd. I, I was all ears. I wanted to know what it was I had to do. And all they told me to do is try to find a church, get into the Word, because your faith will grow by reading the word. And I did that. So praying to God. You know what I'm saying? Just asking for help. Oh, yeah. And, uh, over a matter of months, pretty soon a year go by, the tobacco would go away. Pretty soon the didn't want no desire for marijuana anymore, no desire for the the booze anymore, the pills anymore. And, uh, man, what a relief that is now to be clean now uh, all these years. And, uh, don't even have a feeling for it. Don't even bother me at all. Uh, of course, the doctors got me on a couple of prescriptions that uh, convinced me that uh, support for me to take. But right. 
Uh, other than that, I just believe in the Lord for it, and uh, He's been good to yeah. me. You know, that's awesome. a that's, that's a blessing. You know, God is uh, really taking you to that next level and taking you out of that situation. How low did you actually get uh, when you was hooked on the marijuana, hooked on the dope, uh, as you said, selling the you know, selling drugs? You know, what what was your lows and lows that God has pulled you out of out of? Well, you know, I, I tell the story in my book about the book about uh, uh, is that wrestling fake? That's the name of it. The mm-hmm. mere fact by from co-op Scott Teal. Pro co producer of the book, and uh, he ended up wanting to do the book, and I insisted it being from my version, like the truth, you know, from my side, and uh, the witness in it. And uh, I tell the different situations, like uh, get to the point that uh, take a go to the Middle East to wrestle in Kuwait, uh, a bunch of Americans, and uh, ended up uh, on the plane over there. Get into my vodka that I was carrying, uh, that it wasn't even allowed in Kuwait. It's not even allowed over there. Booze, duty free shop, sold it to me anyway. They were carrying my bag. I drank it all before I got there. Got in a fight on the airplane. Probably heard about it with the iron sheet. Got mm-hmm. bit on the <laughs> you know, that's pretty low when you get that. Because I could have been thrown in jail as a terrorist or anything. And right. uh, they came up the plane uh, with the machine guns and everything. Mr. Fuji was my spokesman. I guess he talked him out of it, said he had me under control, had me strapped to the seat, and every time I went to move, he'd uh, take the seat belt tighter. But uh, I thank I thank uh, God for a guy like him to be there in control to, to make sure that I was all right. But that's just one example. I mean, there's examples of me, uh, like, like getting to the bars over as far as Japan, over here in America, getting to tearing the bar apart, having to pay for the damage. And everybody on the trip to Japan was hot at it because they split it up between 10 guys or whatever. It was over there at the tour, and all had to pay $300 or something because the damage was like $3,000. So everybody hates me after that because uh, I'm the one that started the fight because uh, I would uh, arm wrestling with one of the boys, Buck Bramstead. He ended up putting me down once. I guess I was drunk. Put me down the second time. Uh, Matt Dogmashan told me, he said, uh, I said to him, one more time, you put me down this time, I'm going to punch you in the nose. And that's why I said it. I don't even remember. Mm-hmm. And he put me down again. I punched him in the nose, knocked him down, went into, tore the bar all over. And I don't, I can't even remember. All I remember is getting up the next day, and my face was all tore up, and my clothes was tore. I just went to bed like that, all bloody and everything. Came downstairs. I thought, what's going on? I walked out of my room, and I knew that there was something wrong because the guy I was in a fight with, but he came out of the room across from me just as I was coming out. And I said, hey, Buck, how you doing this morning? Because I couldn't remember that. He's up, up, you're the uh, first me out, you know. <laughs> I punched him. No, I can't blame him. But it was doing stuff like this. You know, whenever you go downtown New York and you're driving your car, and luckily I was by myself, but even then, if I would have been stopped, uh, I see some guys in a van pulled over to the side. I figure they're making pull over. Uh, hey, you got eight ball? You got there? Uh, yeah. You guys, I guess you recognize who I was, or I don't know if he did or not, but yeah, I got 100 bucks. Well, okay. You could have been just joking. He gave me, but it wasn't. And uh, this stupid stuff like that. I even got one day at uh, going up to Virginia Play, I got stopped, and uh, this was the situation. I actually stopped at a stop store to, uh, like, one of the stop places to get uh, booze and stuff. And I stopped there for something in the bathroom, stop or some more booze or whatever. And then coming out, I noticed this van there, and I said to the guy, playing booze, I said to him, hey, you got a doobie? And he says, hey, Ivan, how you doing? Yeah, I got somebody. He went in the truck. I went over, got in my car and waited. He came over to him. He handed me, like, I don't know, pouch with, with some ace here. There you go. He says, I just busted a guy there down the road here and got it off him, so you can go ahead. You take it, but uh, be careful. Man. And uh, I see him driving off, and I notice his at the back of his bumper, state trooper. I said, oh, my God, he set me up, you know. But no, he didn't. He just gave it to me and let me go. I guess he must have been put the force or something. I don't know, but, man, I, I, a lot of times stuff like that happens. Crazy stuff. A bunch of guys tried to jump in New York one day, 
And uh, when I parked the car, it was in the parking lot, triple decker or whatever it was, at the hotel on Holiday Inn. And I uh, reached in the back. I was carrying a large machete back there before I was carrying the gun. Reached in, got this machete about three feet long, pulled it out. And he said, yeah, what do you want, guys? And they were coming towards me. They seen the machete. They took off running. <laughs> they think this guy's crazy, he's drunk, or something. They're right on all all counts. But that when you get that low that, that that you're not a good husband, you're not a good father, you're not even a good person, you're gone all the time, you're mean. Well, if you give your kids a lick and it's with a weightlifting belt, you know, you don't have to do it too often when you do it like that. That's terrible. So I knew I had to get off of this stuff but man, I guess uh God had to get my attention first and I'm glad he did. So Yes, yeah, definitely right. glad he did. You know, God God will take you and get your attention and take you to another level and allow you yeah. to realize uh, realize how wonderful he is and all the opportunities and all the things that he blocked you from um, that you yeah. could have could have experienced. Um, and that's, that's just right. how, how good a God that we serve is. I mean, he's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person. You know, we you know you are truly a testament. I was talking to someone the other day. And we look at when we look at wrestlers um, who are die who died early. They usually a generation, um, in, in our generation, you got the young guys who are dying. But from your generation, those guys are still living, like the Ric Flair, the Dusty Rhodes, the the Black Jack Mulligan. I mean, those type of guys, or the Johnny Rods from your generation are actually still living. But when you get into the wrestlers who came in the late seventies or uh, excuse me. Uh, late seventies, early eighties. A lot of those guys are are passing early. Uh, yeah. This is something that you said done. It seemed like your your generation was able to handle it and, and quit it than the generation uh, of the eighties wrestlers who was able to who just took it to a different level. Yeah, that's a that's just got to be the mercy of God because the grace of the uh, heavenly Father. Because really, uh, myself. Uh, you know, get, get into trouble as a teenager and ending up in maximum security penitentiary. You know, you think it would scare me enough to walk a, a straight line, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But when you're young like that, you do stupid things, and you think you're invincible. I call out to the Lord every time I had a car wreck or I was in trouble or I was hurt or something, you know, needed help, and then just go back to being the same person that I was before, you know, instead of, you know, just be grateful all the time and having a relationship with the Lord. And I, that's what I try to do now. And it, it, I think it's a good testament. Like you said, the idea that, that through that, that I can end up talking to guys that's been in trouble before. I can talk to guys that's been drugs with alcohol before. Talk about, uh, you know, the idea of being a good father, a good husband, or that I, because I was on the other side, I wasn't. So I realized that. And, you know, it's uh, maybe not too late that I can, God maybe uh, had mercy on me, and it was maybe too late when I ended up quitting it and uh, asking him to come into my heart, you know. So I'm thankful you know, anyway, buddy. Thank you. With that being said, Mr. Cole, we want to appreciate you. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to hear more of Ivan Koloff's story, uh, you need to check out this documentary, but you won't be able to check it out if you do not go to Kickstarter.com. Ivan Koloff, a uh, documentary, and help us out. He's a few. We're not too. They're not too far off from their goal. Uh, check out Kickstarter.com, Ivan Koloff, and make this documentary uh, a success. Allow this documentary to be produced in mass production and sent out to the masses, uh, and to help. Uh, a legend out, as we stated here on the Wrestling Marks of Excellence, the third WWF, WWF champion, the man who ended the streak of all streaks. You can say what you want. 21-year streak has nothing compared to Bruno San Martino's seven-year streak, and this was the gentleman who ended that streak. Uh, this was the gentleman who set uh, true Russians, uh, the Russian feud that you're currently watching in the WWE product. If it had not been for him, Nikita and Krusha Khrushchev, we may, you may not have a Rusev coming from Russia and with Oksana, uh, uh, you know, talking about uh, Putin, uh, excuse, me, yeah. excuse me, Lana talking about Putin, uh, you may not have that. But because of uh, Ivan Kolov, Nikita Kolov, and Krusha Khrushchev, who, who made the Russian gimmick uh, great, these guys had heat everywhere, please go out, learn some of the stories, go to IvanKolov.com, uh, get his book, uh, IvanKolov.com, once again, get his book, uh, check that out as well, the documentary, 
check it out. Done by Michael Elliott, who does a great job with documentaries. Uh, once again, Kickstarter.com. I can call, sir. We appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. And anytime you need us, man, please look us up. Give us a call. Uh, we thank you for here. You're always welcome here at the Wrestling Marks of Excellence on Fox Sports Radio 1340. Well, thank you so much, guys, for uh, doing this and uh, for all the fans out there. thought the fans could drop us nothing in the, the business. And uh, even if you booed me, I, I don't care. That's beside the point. The promoters told me a long time ago I was too ugly to be a good guy. So that's, uh, that's all right. If I may, though, uh, if I could just put a little plug in for my daughter also. My youngest daughter's here with me in this area. And uh, uh, her and her husband uh, sing uh, gospel. And they're very, very good. Uh, HighwayRevival.com, you can check them out. Uh, they go out every Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, uh, and uh, they end up uh, singing for, for the Lord, uh, singing for the Lord. And man, if you'd like to come to your church, uh, give them a, a pull them up on the computer there, HighwayRevival.com, just like it sounds like, HighwayRevival.com. All right, thanks again, brother. God bless you guys. God bless you too. Thank you, sir. Hey, once again, if you're not confirmed, consider yourself denied. 